Hello everyone, welcome back to Trek Today. I have a little bit of a different video, longer than the usual format for this channel, a QA. and a About a month or so ago I posted on the community page, you had any questions you have for me, and I got a bunch on that, and then from videos since then people have kind of been uh, posting questions and a couple on Twitter. So I have my computer next to me, I wrote down a bunch of them, tried to organize some of them, there were some that were very uh, similar or in the same kind of category, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and check those out uh, and if you don't hear your question addressed I probably uh, missed it somewhere along the line and it might appear in a video someday. I have so many videos, so many topics. A lot of these are even topics that I just haven't gotten around to doing yet because you know Star Trek is endless. Uh, so lots of questions and we're gonna go ahead and start with the first one. It's kind of a general how long have you been watching Star Trek? Uh, roughly I figured it out about 34 years almost to the day actually you know time frame wise with the best of both worlds so I was very very young you know one of my earliest memories ever so basically my entire life uh, I've been watching Star Trek. Uh, then, uh, what Star Trek shows do you find yourself watching the most these days? You know, what do I watch the most now? Lately, I've been probably watching the most Enterprise and TNG. I've been watching episodes starting with like the very first, you know, the beginning of TOS, and watching the whole franchise in order very slowly with my wife every once in a while. So on my own, I've been more just kind of putting on random episodes uh, that I find to be enjoyable and I've also been leading up to eventually I'm going to be going to a trip to Germany which I have not been to since I was a kid. I've been trying to watch some episodes that I have in German so that's mostly a couple DVD releases of other shows but mostly Enterprise and um, the TNG because they have all those different audio tracks. The Blu-rays are region free and they have all the different audio tracks on them. So I've been watching them in German with English and subtitles and those are both really good shows as well to be kind of just episodic, you know, throw on an episode for fun and watch. So a lot of TNG and Enterprise lately. Uh, and two, they're kind of related. Favorite Star Trek gift anyone has ever given you and was the first Star Trek thing I ever bought with my own money as a kid, like allowance type thing. Uh, as far as favorite Star Trek gift ever, I think probably the biggest thing was around, I guess, the Christmas after the release of uh, Voyager. So Voyager started in January, and that following Christmas, I remember I got both the TNG Bridge playset, which was really awesome, and the entire uh, first run of Voyager action figures. So the entire, that first, you know, Series 1. I forget how many figures were in that. Maybe like 9 or 10, something like that. Whatever, you know, most of the crew and things like that. So that Christmas was really big. I was like one of the biggest, you know, Christmas things I ever got just in general. But as far as Star Trek, that really sticks out in my mind. So uh, I guess that would have been, what, Christmas 95? So I think that's, that's when that was. But that's probably the coolest as far as, like, gift I've ever received and actually have I think the first thing I ever got with my own money as a kid I still have my this 1995 art of Star Trek book which is a this is a I did a video on this that's not up yet it's one of those ones that's uh, you know on the on the dock ready to go uh, but this I think was the first one I ever got as, as a kid you know as a kid obviously most stuff was like a gift or whatever uh, but around Christmas time I always had a little bit of money from grandparents that I would buy maybe action figures but I don't think I started until a little bit later, so I'm pretty sure that book is the first thing I ever got as a kid with my own allowance money. Uh, I know that was from a, a Borders bookstore, which is no longer around. Uh, so that was a huge thing. It's one of my favorite Star Trek books because I would just pour over that. This is pre, like we didn't have internet at all, any of that kind of stuff. I didn't have a whole lot of the Star Trek technical manuals, art books, or anything yet. This really just had some uh, kids' books and things, and then this. So this was uh, like a tome. This was, for me, this was like my encyclopedia. This was my my, my holy book uh, when I was a kid. And so I treasure that. Uh, then we have, uh, does your wife like Star Trek? Uh, yeah, my wife like Star Trek. Uh, she's more on my other channel, hasn't been on this one. She grew up in a very Star Trek household. Her dad loves Star Trek the way I do. He's part of the original audience. And, and then I really love Star Trek, and so she's kind of grown up around it. She's not as passionate about it as I am, uh, but she's definitely a Star Trek fan uh, and really enjoys it. So it's been a lot of fun kind of watching Star Trek with her over time. And then a whole bunch of questions that I put together kind of related to Star Trek movies. Uh, favorite movie and least favorite Star Trek movie. Um, my favorite movie is Rathacon. It, you know, it's one of the more typical answers, but I think it is for a reason. I just I love Rathacon. I think it's just a, a perfect movie. I love it. 
watch it every year at least once. Uh, least favorite movie, Into Darkness. I There's another question coming up here I'll talk about it a little more, but I hate that movie. I really, really do. It's actually the only Star Trek movie we don't own a copy of. Uh, then we have most rewatched Star Trek movie, which is actually a different answer than Wrath of Khan. Uh, it's probably either Voyage Home or First Contact. Uh, those two, for some reason, I find to be just the most rewatchable. But when I'm just kind of throwing on a Star Trek movie, I'm not really in a specific mood or I'm not watching, say, like the trilogy of, you know, two, three, or four, or whatever. Those are the two that'll gravitate more to. I think four, just because of the, the tone of it, being a little more lighthearted, a little more uh, comedic, makes it more casually rewatchable. And then First Contact, because the age range that I'm in, that was, I think, the biggest, you know, Star Trek experience I ever had. You know, that was in collecting all the, the candy bars with the, the different rappers and the action figures and going to the theaters. I think we saw them twice in theaters, which was a big deal. So that was a huge thing. So First Contact is a very, you know, special part of watching Star Trek for me. And that ties into uh, Star Trek movies that I've seen in theaters. The first one I ever saw in theaters, you know, I was too young really for any of the TOS movies. The first one I saw in theaters was Generations, and then of course First Contact, so all the TNG movies, I saw all those. And then I have seen Star Trek you know, 2 and 4 in theaters for different anniversaries. So those I've seen in theaters, and those are the only ones I've seen in theaters. I haven't seen any of the other ones. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, Kelvin movies, I saw the first one in theaters. The other two I actually did not see until later, until they came out on DVD. Um, so that, and favorite Star Trek documentary. Uh, the, it's one of those things, Star Trek, there's so many amazing documentaries, whether it's behind the scenes of a specific show or something like uh, For the Love of Spock, you know, about more about a certain character in Leonard Nimoy. Other ones that are more about the legacy of Star Trek, like a lot of the anniversary ones. I really like the 25th anniversary uh, in celebration hosted uh, by LeVar Burton. A lot of great ones, a lot of ones that go into the history and detail. But if I had to pick a favorite documentary, it's probably going to be Trekkies. I adore Trekkies. I've seen this countless numbers of, of times. It just, it hit such a, 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 just the right note when I first saw it on VHS as a kid, you know, rented it from the video store. I was really excited. And that was my first real, I think, window into a broader fandom. It didn't have the internet back then, so it didn't have that access. And I was a kid and I knew other people that liked Star Trek. There were always a lot of people I knew that watched it, but it was a different sensation of like, oh, I watched that show and I like it to like I'm a, I'm a Trekkie and it really means something you know, deeper to me than just a show that I like. There weren't as many people in that category. I think that's really, you know, Trekkies was my first real window into, you know, a broader scope of people that were more like that, more like my level of passion for it. You know, even, you know, people would watch every episode of TNG and they liked it, but it wasn't like a, like a, a guiding light in their life. It wasn't something that really changed them fundamentally. Uh, and was so impactful to that level as it was for me growing up. And so Trekkies was kind of this very, very fun, sincere look at a element of the fandom and a group of people from a broad spectrum, different age ranges that I felt kind of, that I, I connected with, you know, just watching it. So I loved Trekkies as a kid. And again, I just find it to be just so fun and sincere and enjoyable and funny. So I've always enjoyed Trekkies and I'll never get, get tired of Trekkies. And the last movie related question before we get into other stuff is what are your thoughts on the Kelvin timeline movies? I haven't really, I guess, yeah, I haven't really talked about that much yet on the channel. I just have to think too, because there's so many things that I want to talk about and haven't gotten around to yet, or maybe I filmed it and it hasn't been uploaded yet since I do like every day. I haven't really talked very much about the Kelvin timeline movies. So I'll address that briefly here for the Q&A, starting with the 2009 movie. Uh, this was something where I had, like, weirdly, like, one of the bigger birthday celebrations I had. A whole group of friends of mine got together, and we had a big dinner. And 
at uh, Hibachi and it was really fun and then we were going to go see movies so we went and saw that and my I remember that year not related to Star Trek but my big gift was all those friends got together contributed some money and I was going they paid for me to go with a friend to a uh, Xena convention in Jersey that was really fun with my friend Lauren and I went uh, that was great uh, but anyway so we went and saw Star Trek and from the previews I was a little I don't know I don't really want to see a you know remake of a TOS era movie I want to see something pushing the franchise further so I wasn't really into the premise and I was like I don't know recasting these iconic characters and watched it and it was interesting especially because the group of friends I was watching it with majority of them weren't big Trekkies there were a few that were Star Trek fans and a bunch that had seen little to none of Star Trek and that was one of the curious things was after the movie the difference in the experience that those different crowds had because the non Star Trek fans liked it a lot more than the Star Trek fans uh, and the way I kind of discussed it because I was sort of the biggest you know Trekkie of the group and whatever um, is that as just kind of a fun summer action sci-fi movie it was a solid 8 out of 10 uh, decent as you know to be decent to good and as a Star Trek movie, like a four. Um, not horrible, but just ugh, lackluster. So that's kind of where I was at, was I couldn't say, oh, this was a bad movie. I don't think it was a bad movie at all, but it wasn't a great Star Trek movie, and I had such mixed feelings going into it. I mean, as far as what they were trying to accomplish, and as far as the, the casting, and as far as the portrayal of these iconic characters, that, with one exception, was actually really good. That's a hard thing to do. Again, it's like, I didn't really want to see that, but if you're going to do that, they did a good job. My favorite in that group being Carl Urban. I think his McCoy was so spot on. He's, a, he's an actor that I've I've always really liked, you know, going back to, again, went to a Xena convention, so to me, he's always Caesar and Cupid. Uh, but as Dr. McCoy, as Bones, he was fantastic. He, and everyone, no matter what their performance level was, everyone in that movie genuinely seemed to be giving it their all and really wanting to become that character in their own little version of it, but while also being true. And there was a great sense of effort from the the cast and definitely a great sense to me of appreci appreciation for the kind of legacy they were stepping into. So from that element, again, there was a lot of good intentions in it. The one thing I really disliked, and I understand why they did it, but the Chris Pine Kirk, I can't stand that Kirk. Um, I understand why the character is a little different. There's even a deleted scene that goes a little bit more into the slight differences in history, and he has the altered a lot of stuff, you know, the alternate timeline, you know, to fit these these characters together in this situation that wouldn't have been impossible before, wouldn't have been possible before, as that you know they weren't even in the academy all at the same time, and it's all whatever. But for this variation, the problem that I had was that he was very much the Kirk, the stereotype of Captain Kirk that people who haven't really watched TOS have in their minds versus the way Captain Kirk actually was. Um, this kind of like you know, cowboy action hero, ladies man, Kirk. Just that portrayal, it just rubbed me the wrong way, and I got why that character was different. And again, they should get that deleted scene in to help kind of explain it a little better in the context, but I didn't like that. Obviously, visually, I didn't like it at all. Uh, the, the, the shimmery, lens flary, everything looks like just so clean and pristine in a way that doesn't feel tangible. And there's just something about the visual styling that really irked me. I didn't like that at all. But again, the effects quality was really, really good. It was more of a artistically, I didn't like it, but quality wise, that's what I mean. I can't say it's a bad movie. Uh, but the writing to me also had issues where the one thing that I, in theaters, I couldn't believe, I actually said, what the, out loud in the theaters, I caught myself, I couldn't believe that because I was so just blown away at the end of the movie, how wow, this cadet did an amazing job you are now a captain. We're giving you a starship. What? <laughs> Cadet to captain? And just, just, there was little elements of the writing in that movie where it was, it's part of a good story. Part of good storytelling is making something feel believable 
even if it's something like magic and something outside the realm of actual reality, make it feel like it is believable within the context of the reality you're creating in this, this fictional world. And that suspension of disbelief is so important. And this movie broke that for me so many times to where it felt like there was some immaturity and some lack of logic to a lot of the writing. And that, that moment just kind of solidified that, like culminated in that moment of like, what? And I, yeah, okay, just so that they can be together for the previous movies, whatever. It just, I don't know, there were things about that that it was a very mixed experience. And again, but you know, we do own it because there are some things about it, like I said, that I do enjoy. And I kind of, for what they were trying to do, it was a decent effort, but there were things that were mixed. Into Darkness, the Hubert Cumberbatch, like just him as an actor being con, just was a baffling choice, even from just the previews. It was like, I, I didn't see it in theaters just because of that by itself. Saw it on DVD. I hated that movie. I genuinely think it, that, that actually think is a bad movie. Not just I didn't enjoy it as a Star Trek movie. I think like it's a bad movie. Unlike 2009, where I think it's you know just my my personal taste of Star Trek versus that. That's a bad movie. Uh, then beyond the last one, again there were parts of it that it felt like I saw someone describe it once as like Star Trek: The Fast and the Furious, and there are moments in there. Where I feel like it does go that direction too far and it's not a perfect movie but I actually find it really overall enjoyable for the most part I thought it was a lot of fun I felt like the the interactions between a lot of the characters felt finally much more after two movies of really getting into those characters lived in and there were things about it that I just really liked. I like a lot of the art direction was great. You know, even the action that was a little too, again, like that Fast and the Furious was a great way of explaining that. There's still a lot of parts of it that were fun. It was a great sci-fi action flick, you know, summer blockbuster kind of thing, but there was enough real Star Trek in it that it was never, it's never gonna be one of my favorite Star Trek movies, but I think it's, for me, the most enjoyable of those three. Uh, so to me, it's just that's, that was a fun movie. Uh, a couple of favorite questions here: favorite alien races. I love Klingons. I've always loved Klingons. So that's number one. Uh, Deep Space Nine is my favorite Star Trek, so definitely heavily invested in Bajor and that culture. And I also really like the Trills. And I like that they are getting a little more into the Orions because I've always found them fascinating, and I always want to see more beyond just kind of being the pirate type element so those are probably a lot of my favorites you know Vulcans obviously but uh, Vulcans are such a staple of Star Trek that as far when I think of like a different alien culture I want to get more into and stuff it doesn't enter my mind as quickly as something like Klingons or the Trill or the Bajoran so those are definitely my favorites and then favorite characters which I actually can't mention I'm not gonna answer that one in this video because that is actually my next big video project that I just haven't had time to get around to finish. I'm doing a top 50 favorite Star Trek characters, uh, giving each character a short video. Uh, so it's going to be spread out over like a couple of months, kind of how I did my favorite episodes of Star Trek, that big series. My next big one is favorite characters. So I won't really spoil that in this one, but so look forward to that coming. The next one is a little hard to really answer concisely in a video like this, but what keeps your love of Star Trek going? Uh, because it really is a, for me, lifelong tale. It's the, the curiosity, the exploration, both abroad, both exploring space and, and the mysteries of what is out there and, and furthering science and exp through that lens exploring deeper, more personal elements of humanity and the interactions with the characters. And there's so many different parts and then that gets into each Star Trek show that kind of explores it in different light so that kind of takes into new territory but uh, it's just this hopeful exploration of the potential of humanity exploring great fantastical worlds and the fun adventures and great levels of comedy just every little piece of, of Star Trek that you know makes it come together just what is constant reviewing. It's something that has been a part of my life and will be a part of my life forever. So what keeps my love for Star Trek going is that it's such a huge part 
of who I've always been that this, I could never like let it go. It's literally a part of, of who, why I am the way I am and a lot of the interests that I have and things that I've explored and a lot of my sense of morality has come from Star Trek. A lot of, you know, again, a lot of how I view the world has come through the lens of growing up with classic Star Trek. So it's, yeah, my, my, to ever fall out of love with Star Trek would be a level of just completely changing who I am as a person entirely that I don't think it's, it's feasible. So Star Trek, even if it just ended today, you know, there's never any new Star Trek ever in the future, I would never run out of love of re-watching, re-reading, re-exploring, re-listening you know, to the music, everything for the rest of my life. So that's just a part of who I am. And a couple related to the shows, if more new Trek is to come, what are your hopes and what would you like to see? I mean, honestly, the show they've already set up with Legacy is kind of what I would like to see. Uh, what I would like to see is in terms of how that is portrayed. I really, you know, as much as I liked that third season of Star Trek Picard, I liked what it did for more of an ending for that era of Star Trek and building up to a new one, but what I prefer is a Star Trek that is more episodic. The tone is much more focused on exploration and, and mystery and a sense of positivity than was portrayed there. Like it's one of those things where I really enjoyed it for what it was, but if I want a new weekly you know, television show, I'd like something to be much more in tone, more like, like a TNG or even the early Voyager TOS and to that added a little more of the undercurrent of some continuing stories and the deeper character development of something like Deep Space Nine. Uh, something more along the lines of like season four of Enterprise where it had little maybe two three episode story arcs but was largely episodic. That mix I think is perfect especially if we go back to having real seasons of TV shows not seven episodes, eight episodes, ten if you're lucky, like, yeah, it's, but that's more what I would like to see, something that's a little more episodic and a little more focused on the exploration element and rather than more of the action, something that's a little more hopeful, not as depressing, I just, I, that's what I would like to see, that, that Star Trek that tries to envision that future and, and the betterment and exploring is the main element, you know, just the line of, you know, do you remember we used to be explorers? Yeah, that's what I want to see. That's what you know, Star Trek is at its core. So I'd like things to move in that direction. Um, anything that is in existence that kind of follows that, I think, play the latest, you know, Star Trek game, Resurgence. I honestly think that comes the in its storytelling, not quite there, but like 90% of the way there to what I want from a modern Star Trek TV show. That's why I really like that, that game so much. It's come so close to what I would like to see happen on screen again, hopefully for Star Trek. Uh, then we have, what is your least favorite show or movie from Legacy Trek? That is kind of an interesting one, because it's kind of like a, a least favorite among my favorites. Um, I would, I mean, overall, I'd have to say probably like the animated series. Uh, also, there's another question talking about what I think of Star Trek, the animated series, so I'll, I'll leave that. But sticking with the live action shows, it would be Enterprise, but that's, you know, one of my still in my top 10 shows of all time. So it's my least favorite among the favorites. Uh, and that is because I had kind of a negative reaction going into it, uh, which I've talked about in my favorite episodes of Star Trek video in a couple times, so I'll just very briefly kind of go through here. It came at a time where I was leading into adulthood, where I'd grown up with Star Trek, and Star Trek was always moving in a linear fashion, like towards the future. We had to were past the Dominion War, Voyager's back, TNG, you know, is up in, in the movies, and the, we're at a point now where all these great epic, these storylines have been seasons and seasons long, and years of my life growing up have come to a conclusion, and now we're at a, a, a crossroads where we have a new era, a post-Dominion War era with Voyager Home, and I want to see what's going on. I want to explore that as I'm at a point in my life where I am looking 
entirely just 100% focused on the future. There are different parts in your life and stages in your life now that I'm approaching middle age, not quite there yet, um, but there's different stages where you look back more, I think, at certain points, and at certain points you focus so much more in a forward momentum, like towards your future, what you're looking for. So Star Trek was at a perfect point to move to the future. I was at a perfect point in my life, you know, at the end of high school, moving into college, seeking, you know, what my future is going to be. So everything in my, my, my emotional state was looking forward. And then here was a show that was looking, just going backwards. And so I really just went into Enterprise with a very negative attitude. And uh, actually, this answers another question too. How, you know, have, is there a show that you've changed your opinion on over time? And then, so Enterprise, I'll just include that here. Uh, so Enterprise, I kind of stopped watching partway through. I was so focused on other things and just watching a TV show on a set schedule anyway was not as feasible in that, that point in my life. So I don't know, I just kind of stopped watching partway through because I wasn't as interested. And then eventually when I was at a point where I wanted to go back and rewatch it because I did see some things that I did like when I had watched the seasons one and part of two, um, so I went back and I really fell in love with it. It's uh, overall, again, my least favorite of those classic era live action Star Treks, but it's still one of my favorite shows ever. And it just, I needed to be in a different mindset for it. I really wasn't at the, the, the right place mentally and emotionally to appreciate what it was. Uh, so yeah, that's, you know, again, the, that fourth season, yeah, Enterprise, I'll talk about more in the future, more because of the very di big differences in the structure of the storytelling is between seasons one and two, and then three and four. It's like three different eras of that show. Uh, but yeah, it's like season four of Enterprise is one of my favorite seasons of Star Trek in general. I just love it. Uh, and then if you, you know, include it, because I know I just want to talk about it. It's a little bit of a separate category, even though it is pretty much the fourth season of TOS. The animated series would be below, you know, Enterprise, and that's one that I really enjoy, but it's never been quite to the same level as the other entries in the franchise. It's one that I've always enjoyed, but it's always been a little more secondary uh, to me. Just a, I like a, a dis, I don't dislike animation. I have a lot of you know, animated you know, shows and movies that I really love, but it just wasn't quite for me as much as I liked it at the same same level of uh, just emotional pull and interaction as the live action shows. So that's kind of like a two tier answer. And last one related to sort of the you know legacy of Star Trek TV shows is you know favorite episodes of Star Trek. And um, if you haven't seen it, which this you know we're we'll asked that question probably is not. I did a huge series, the biggest I've ever done, probably might ever do because it was an intense amount of work on my favorite episodes of Star Trek. It's a big multi-part series. Each part is like 30, 40 minutes. It's a huge thing. Go ahead and check that out. I'll, of course, put that playlist in the description at the end of this video because that was a ton of work, but I love doing it. And I think it is the best way to explore and understand what, you know, what I love the most about Star Trek and like, you know, what really draws me into it, I think. You talk about the favorite episodes at length and really what they mean to me, especially that last part getting into the top 10, but in general, the whole thing. I think that's like the best way of exploring the Trek a day, you know, the, all the, what's behind it really. And then we have things you don't like about Strange New Worlds. Uh, Strange New Worlds has been interesting because again, when I do my very, when I watch the episodes of these newer shows, I do a very off the cuff, like I had stop at the end of the credits and immediately start recording don't write anything whatever it's an immediate reaction and i very much try to in that context be very positive i focus more much more on the positive and um at times i think the one thing that i don't like about that i like it because it's very raw and like unedited and just gives my immediate reaction but i think there's also when I'm trying to be a little more on the positive side, I tend to also not give it, I guess, quite as truthful of a perspective because I talk about some of the negative, but again, I try to be a little more positive. And I think the other thing too is that there's been so little of the Star Trek that truly feels like classic Trek, even in the shows that I do like in modern Star Trek, that having something I felt more in that direction I want it to be much more positive because I feel like I, I want more of that. Uh, but really, in general, I am a little more 
mixed on Strange New Worlds. You know, Strange New Worlds, there are elements of it that, again, I, I absolutely adore, and I think there are some episodes in there that feel like the closest we've really had to a true feeling of a Star Trek episode since 2005. So there are things about Stranger Worlds that I love, but there are things I'm a little more mixed on, and part of those are not the fault of the show, but of the, the current TV landscape. They're not really, until things are you know, shake up a little bit in the streaming era, fades or changes radically, it's not gonna quite accomplish. Uh, but some things just very general that I are on the dislike side rather than like, because again, there are some things about it that I absolutely love. Uh, one thing, you know, visually, it's in, a, it's in a difficult position, again, constantly doing the prequels, Let's move forward, but it's a hard place to be, especially with where it's at, where Pike is on what is to be, you know, Kirk's Enterprise, you know, there obviously can be some, some changes, but it has to be very close to that, and at the same time, look very, you know, it can't look like they took footage from 19, you know, 1960s and Put on TV now, so it's a weird spot where how, what do you change, what do you modernize, what do you keep the same? And to me, the outer look of the ship found that balance perfectly. I love the way it looks, even the little details with like the, the ship nipples, as my wife calls them, uh, from you know the cage version of the Enterprise. Like little things about that Enterprise, it looks it, to me, it's a perfect outer design to where it looks true enough to the original and the minor changes to make it a little more modernized for a newer audience or they're not overbearing. It's kind of this nice little balancing act that I think is done very well. But I can't say the same about the interior sets. Uh, again, Pike's luxury apartment is kind of odd. I'm not, I, I'm not, I've never been sold on that. Uh, but there are things that are just, again, uh, the, the sick bay I actually really like. I think that was a good balance also. I think that they did a good job with. Again, it's not quite, but it's like, okay, you could see alterations are made over time and it's modernized, but still feels kind of how it should be. It's close. The hallways, like there are some things that are very kind of, I'm a little more mixed on. But the two, which to me are like the two most important set pieces that I genuinely dislike are engineering and the bridge. And the, those are in a, you know, in a Star Trek vessel and an Enterprise. Like those are the two most important sets. I hate the engineering design. It looks overly massive, and I just don't like the design of it. I don't, I don't like that that engineering set at all. And I hate the bridge. I absolutely 100% hate that bridge design. The bridge design from TOS, because there's, you know, I've heard people make the argument of, oh, you can't do that. It won't look good in a modern TV show. It's a bunch of crap. Um, they've already shown, you know, the Enterprise in season four, the two-parter in a mirror darkly, that's fairly modern, and you know, you can watch it in HD and it looks fantastic. It actually it doesn't look like this archaic thing from another time. It's one thing that I love about that particular bridge design. There are designs within the original Enterprise, I understand why they would change some, because it looks very much from a different era. But that bridge design is Something about it is feels timeless. There's something about that design, even in comparison to a lot of the other sections of the original Enterprise that, again, can feel dated. Something about that bridge, it just works. And I just watched, you know, I'm wearing my Terran Empire shirt because last night I just happened to be re-watching, uh, you know, In a Mirror Darkly, and it just reiterated the, the point in my mind, like, this looks fantastic, this looks just fine in a modern context. It looks brilliant. I mean, I'm right there an example uh, that you could change that maybe a little for the context of the show, but keep it you know, 75, 80% the same. Just change a little bit here and there and it would look fantastic. And this, like, I don't know, this shimmery chrome, you know, dark lit monstrosity. I, I hate the bridge design. So again, Stranger Worlds, there are things about it that I really like, and there are some, it's these, you know, peaks and valleys where there's some episodes, I'm like, wow, this is great classic Trek, this is awesome. And then it's like, okay, that was okay, but still, you know, it's still decent. I don't think there's a single episode of Strange New Worlds that I openly, like, I just, I dislike that. There are a few, um, you know, I did my review of certain time travel episodes, it's probably my least favorite, but even that was like, it's not terrible, it's just, there are things about it that I really have a problem with. Uh, so overall, it's been a really good experience, and even in 
the elements that I dislike, there's so much else that I do really like. But yeah, that's what I don't like about Strange New Worlds in general. And then, uh, worst or least favorite episodes of Star Trek. And to avoid opening a can of worms and having people go at each other in the comments, because I don't want people to be nice to each other, I'm going to stick with worst or least favorite episodes of Classic Trek. Enterprise and backwards uh, to avoid getting into certain territory. There are obvious ones like Code of Honor and things like that. They're obvious choices, but I think two that have always stuck in my mind. I'll pick the two episodes that I've always done. This when someone asks that question, these are the two that come into my mind first. First one comes to my mind: The Naked Now, the one where everyone gets drunk um, on TNG. A lot of you know. TNG Season 1, I think it gets more of a bad rap than it deserves. There are some downright horrible episodes, like you know, The Naked Now, and there are some that are very mixed, but I think if you rewatch it as a whole, there are some episodes that are actually better than you might remember, and I think as a whole it's an unsteady start, and obviously not as good as it would get, but it's not quite as bad as its reputation. Like, it, it's, a, it's an okay season with some ups and downs. Uh, just kind of, it's, you know, but that's one that sticks out, and my least favorite episode of TNG. I know there's some people that like it and think it's just kind of a funny, you know, you know, farcical episode. I don't get it. I hate it so much. Rascals. Even as a kid, I hated that Home Alone, kids versus the Ferengi crap. I hate that episode. The whole thing is so stupid. The transporter accident, turning people into kids, and... It, that situation, all right, there's some comical elements there, especially with Keiko and Miles, and like, just like, Miles, like, obviously, yes, it's still Keiko, but she's a kid, and he's not a pedophile, so, like, there's an awkwardness there, and it's really, and it's heartbreaking when Molly doesn't recognize her mother, and, like, you have little moments in there that are interesting, and Picard trying to stay in command for a little bit before he turns over to Riker, because, like, yeah, you can't let this, you know, little kid be in charge of what's he gonna do with his life. They can't fix this. He has to restart, but they still have their adult minds. Like, it's a crazy opportunity. You can imagine having the experience and the intellect and the knowledge of Picard and getting to start over at, like, what, 12? He's going places. And <laughs> that kid, if they hadn't fixed that. But, so, the, the whole thing is silly, uh, but it could work. Until they add the element of the Frankie Pirates taking over the Enterprise, which... Even as a kid, I was genuinely, like, ticked off with the level of stupid. You fought, what, five Ferengi taking over the Enterprise? You make the city worth of people. There are enough random people hanging out in 10 forward to overwhelm them just by numbers. They had, like, Worf and a security force. And there are more security guards on night duty than would be needed to take these guys. The whole thing is ridiculous that they would be able to take control of the Enterprise. And then... That's all just a setup to be able to have these kids who they don't see, you know, as a threat, do all their home alone shenanigans to defeat the Frangi, and it's, oh, it's a comical fun episode. I hate that episode so much. I really do. That is my least favorite episode of like the Enterprise and back, you know, classic Trek. I just it, it rubbed me the wrong way first watching it, being the age age of these kids in this episode, and then every time I've ever revisited it, trying to see if, like, ah, oh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it is just kind of funny over the years, no, I've hated it every time, I watched it when, you know, I'm 10, I watch it when I'm 20, I watch it when I'm, you know, near 40, and I still hate it every time, but Rascals, man, that episode just rubbed me the wrong way. And then we have a few questions about kind of like experience type stuff. Uh, have you ever been to a Star Trek convention? No, I've been to a couple of different conventions. Some that are more but more like general sci-fi. Never been to any specifically just Star Trek convention. Uh, the only specific like show or or you know type of convention I've been to was a Xena convention that I mentioned before. Otherwise, I've been to just general sci-fi conventions, uh, and those more from the time frame focused more on like Stargate and Andromeda and like the X-Files, like not quite as much Star Trek, even though obviously there were a lot of Star Trek fans there, but you know, like Farscape and Lex and that kind of stuff. But no, I've never, never really had the opportunity. There's never really, as, as a kid, obviously you need an adult to take me and there really wasn't an adult in my life who would want to do something like that. So it's never really an option. And then, I don't know, it just has never been a thing as I've gotten older that I've ever done. I've always wanted to, 
but I've just never done it. And conventions on the whole, it's so many people and it's so expensive. And unless you really get to know a group of people or be in the right scenario, it just, I don't know, feels like just an excuse to spend a lot of money. Like, I don't know, there is some camaraderie that like maybe that's kind of what has enticed me to want to go. Uh, again, even as a kid watching, you know, Trekkies and seeing the conventions, like, oh, I want to meet these people and like do that kind of thing. But I don't know, the thing the, that is now seems to be the most popular are the cruises. And I would never go on a cruise, so I don't know if I would ever end up going to that. Uh, and in relation to that, did you ever get to go to the Star Trek experience in Las Vegas? No. That is my biggest, more than a convention, because those will happen probably just about forever for Star Trek. That is the one regret that I've always had. It looks so amazing, the Star Trek experience in Las Vegas. But again, as a kid, no one is going to spend the time and the money to, you know, I'm on the East Coast, you know, I grew up to go the whole way to Vegas to go to, I didn't have, there was no one who was an adult in my life who was that heavily into Star Trek that they would spend the time and money to do that. And then by the time I was old enough that I could afford to do that on my own, it went away. So that, I, man, I missed out on that. I really wish I could have gone to that. And then last thing related to that is have I ever met any of these Star Trek actors? No, not as far as like main cast or whatever. I have met some people that were maybe like a one-off character on say TNG or DS9 or whatever at different conventions again because they also played people on like things like Stargate and stuff like that so I've met people you know actors like that uh, but as far as anyone who's like Star Trek's the thing they're most known for or a main cast member or whatever no uh, you know outside of conventions that'll be a hard thing to do so no I've never met anyone uh, I'm not sure if I'd want to like it's always a thing that I've thought about favorite actors and what would I say to them besides, like, you know, oh, you're a great actor, I love your work, like, I don't know, like, it just, to me, I don't feel a drive to meet that person, especially for certain actors who I really know them mostly for a specific role, to me, it's my, I really love that character so much, it doesn't really have much to do with the person behind the character, you know what I mean, like, it's different, like, I, I want to meet that fictional person, maybe, but I don't know, just, in it, beside, you know, what would I say to them besides, oh, I'm a big fan, it just doesn't seem like an interaction that I would have a drive for. Uh, then, related to collecting a few things, we have uh, favorite items in my Star Trek collection. Probably my favorite thing right now in my Star Trek collection are what I have so far of the laser discs for Star Trek. I've put some videos of some of those up so far. There's still more to come. I've, I've filled, filmed all of them. They're not all up, but. I love Laserdisc as a format. I love Star Trek, so putting them, two of them together. Uh, there's so many different things in my Star Trek collection that I love, but if I had to pick you know, one thing, it would be my Star Trek Laserdisc. I really like them. And that goes into a couple of different questions about you know what are your Star Trek, your overall collecting goals? It's kind of a broad thing to think about, um, but a couple things that I'll mention. One, two, uh, you know, finish getting, I want to get all of the TNG, D Space Nine, and Voyager box sets on Laserdisc. Um, TOS, I have so much TOS in other formats, and I have just kind of random TOS, you know, two episode volumes on Laserdisc. Not as interested in those three big log boxes for those, but I really just, I really want to get all of the, the TNG, they released all seven seasons on Laserdisc, and then Voyager and Deep Space Nine, they released seasons one through five before they discontinued it, so I really want to finish getting all those. Like, that's, I, I love Laserdisc, and that's like the main, my favorite thing on that. So those are one of the main things that are a goal of mine, uh, and then I really have kind of a, a, a list of a, a, a spreadsheet or a document of all the things, the very kind of like the specific, you know, specific things that I would want to add to the Star Trek collection. They're could be things, you know, obviously over the years that you uncover, things you find with thrift store or whatever, but there are like certain things, so like completing that would be really cool. And then the uh, real biggest goal is uh, eventually we want to move to a bigger place and we want to build, we want to have a room that is dedicated to just Star Trek. Literally a Star Trek room in our house is, that's like my big goal, is to have that. Uh, and especially because, you know, in every thing that we have or collect, whether it's our books, whether it's the, you know, the DVDs or the Blu-rays or Laserdisc or toys or whatever, everything that we have stuff from, like a collection or whatever, a huge chunk of that is Star Trek related. So taking all that and putting that in one room makes everything else 
you know, shrink and be much more manageable and not take up, you know, so much room in the house, which is nice. And I would just love that, to have that one big themed room uh, for like just this, this important thing in my life and have all the Star Trek stuff together in that one room. That's like the big ultimate goal. And that relates to the question of what is the, the kind of holy grail of your Star Trek collecting. And again, it's more just like completing those things. Like I have roughly a third, I think, so far of the the season sets that I want on Laserdisc and, and just the, completing that kind of stuff in the Star Trek room. But the one thing that would be kind of a holy grail would be some sort of prop or something from one of the shows. Um, again, that's, that's something that's so out there, not even just expense, but like rarity, because even if there are, there are pieces out there that don't sell for tons of money, but finding them is like almost impossible, or they end up in a personal collection and sit there for 40 years before they recirculate. So it's kind of one of those things that might never happen, uh, but I would love just something and not even anything specific again, because that's way too difficult. We can't be like, oh, I want a model of Voyage or whatever. I want, or I want the the Batleth was used by Worf in Episode Three. Like, you can't, you know, be that specific with that type of thing. Like, it might not exist anymore for starters. And again, it might be in some private collection, some you know, rich guy in France, and it won't be you know unveiled for another seventy-five years till they die. Like, you never know. But just something that has some sort of meaning for me from any of the Star Trek shows again TNG or Deep Space Nine would be like my ultimate goal but even if it was from like Voyager or Enterprise or TOS uh, I wouldn't really care so much about the newer stuff having like a, like a physical you know thing from those shows but from a classic era show just some sort of thing that was actually on film something I can point to uh, I have actually a, a small collection because I got lucky when the show was ending of actual screen used props from Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda. I actually have like a whole little collection of them. And like something like that, something you know, that was used on screen, I can look at an episode and be like, ah, I have that, I can touch that, that little piece of history. Uh, that's always, you know, I would love that. That would be the ultimate kind of like holy grail thing that like might never happen, but that would be the ultimate thing for collecting. And just a few more here, and again, if I missed your question, I'm sorry, hopefully it'll be something that's covered in a topic in a future video. Um, but the last couple here, this is pretty interesting, and I'll definitely get more into it when I do my 50 you know, favorite characters from Star Trek, because that is a little part of why some of my favorites are my favorites, but uh, which Star Trek character are you the most like? Um, again, there's, it's impossible to pick like, one character who will like, oh, I'm exactly like that person. No one is exactly like any other person, fictional or real. Uh, probably the one person that I'm the most like in real life is Worf. Uh, my wife will attest to that. She'll say, you know, she, she's like, oh, you know, I really love Bartok, but I married Worf. And she said that a couple times to me. <laughs> I'm the most, in real life, I'm the most like Worf. Uh, but there are parts of Worf that I'm definitely not like. Uh, I've always been someone who's very, you know, caring and into child care and I very easily get along with children, uh, and Worf, that's not true, and the one thing about Worf is he is not a good dad, uh, so that area, I'm definitely not like Worf, but I'm, I guess I'm like, I'm probably, if I had to just give a number to it randomly, like, I'm like 75% Worf, uh, so I'm very much like Worf and I really understand Worf and I just I I am very much like Worf and then there's a little bit of Bellana in there and the other thing that would put into the mix is definitely a little bit of both Ben and Jake Sisko and I think like uh, there's a I've always been my dream is to be a uh, full-time like writer that's what I would love the most and I've, I really have felt attached to that little part of Jake Sisko, watching him grow up as I was growing up, and I think a lot of that is I, I related and really emotionally reached out to those two characters and that father-son relationship so much at, you know, during my formative years that I feel like bits of their personalities have kind of, you, you emulate that a little bit at a young age and eventually some little bits of that kind of become a part of who you are as you are becoming who you are, because there is that mix of nature and nurture there's a lot of me that is a lot like my dad and then just you know part of the the nature element and then 
you know, it's, it's interesting. But yeah, I most like Worf, and then if I had to pick other characters, it's definitely a little bit of the Cisco's in me. And, like, I do feel a relation to a lot of stuff with Bolana's personality, so might be probably why I like Klingons so much, but uh, that... And uh, why the last one here, why did you start your channel and choose the format, the uh, you know, everyday video, mostly shorter, you know, kind of one, how things came about. I think one of the things that kind of answers that is, again, Trekkies experience. I love Trekkies. And again, the young age of wanting to reach out to people of a similar mind and of even, again, similar in that having a deep love of Star Trek. There's, I love that there is that. It comes in so many different variations. I mean, every Star Trek is someone's favorite Star Trek. Um, and I love that variation and exploring them. That's one of the things I like about Star Trek is the variation in the shows over the, the many, many decades. Uh, so I like that, but in the like mind, again, more of in not exactly my opinions, but my love and passion for, in general, Star Trek in the broadest terms. Um, what are you doing? Sorry, there's a, there's a cat trying to get my attention away from the screen. I've been talking for too long. I'm just getting annoyed. Uh, but, yeah, that was one of the biggest reasons that, like, I've had a YouTube channel going for years that I've just kind of been doing, and it's become more focused on, uh, you know, like, thrift store finds and, like, reselling and that element. Oh, and I liked talking about Star Trek, and there hasn't really been within what that channel is a lot of good places to talk about Star Trek, aside from, I do talk a lot of, like, my media collections, and I talk about that, but that's, again, not broad enough of a scope for kind of an outlet, and that was kind of my way of reaching out, and I've been doing, the reason why I even started YouTube in general is that, you know, when I was little, I actually had a pretty difficult time with, with speech, having a, a speech impediment, and I've never, I'm very... I don't like to talk a lot. You know, I find speaking for long periods of time like this more exhausting than you know, going to the gym and deadlifting. Like I just, I'm very normally a more quiet, stoic kind of person. Again, I'm very wharf usually, and this is a way of me trying to force myself out of that and you know, give myself a place to where I do have to talk a lot. Um, and having something that I love to talk about is helpful in that. So. Just, that's kind of why I really wanted to do this. And as far as the, you know, the Trek a Day concept, and it's, it's something that might evolve over time because it is really difficult to do. Even the really short videos, like people don't realize, I don't make a lot of videos. Even the two, three minute videos, sometimes that can take like half an hour to film, edit, do all that stuff, whatever, and every single day. And so we'll see how things go in the future with this channel doing a little over a year I kind of chose that as something that I like the I, there's so many channels out there that do these like deep dive videos and uh, it's just like a four hour exploration of TNG season three or like every time a new episode comes out or, you know, video essays there's so much out there I want to do something a little different and there's so much Star Trek like I could do a video a day the rest of my life it's not in terms of content ever having you know, a dearth of content it's more of a, an ability to keep up with that kind of thing for something that's just a you know unpaid little hobby thing um, so I wanted a, a way that one of something that was different uh, two that I could explore the many different aspects of Star Trek you know talking about collecting the VHS tapes talking about episodes talking about books, there's so many different things there that, that that kind of hit all those marks for me, doing just the brief little things. I like the idea of just sharing a tiny bit of a love for Star Trek every day. Sometimes it might be a longer form video, but just that little like, hey, here's this cool VHS tape, refreshing your, your memory on these episodes, making you remember and share a little bit of Star Trek in your every day. I like that idea, and I kind of want to keep that up as long as I feel like I can. Um, and so I, I like that, you know, the concept. And I actually, one more question, I missed it. I forgot. I skipped over that. I had a little bit of a cat distraction. But one question about books. Uh, talk about, you know, what are my favorite Star Trek books? Do I have any favorites? And man, there are so many Star Trek books. What are we at? Like around a thousand over the years. Uh, there's many I haven't read, but I've read a good deal of them. And I like doing the book review videos that I'm doing when it's something I haven't read before, 
or I'm reading it again for the first time in a long time. I'm going to get more into that as I've been rereading some books I haven't read since, let's say, like the early 90s. Uh, but as far as favorite books, I think specifically there are a few favorites. One, my all-time favorite I'll talk about because it's a weird one. Uh, it's not one I think most people would pick. But in general, I like a lot of the books that continue the story of Star Trek from the point of Nemesis. Before, you know, a lot of these Star Trek, these new series, it's a very, it's like an alternate, they even did a series of books talking about the split of the timelines and how these are, you know, Picard and everything is an alternate timeline from the books. But the books have almost two decades, it's roughly 15 years of continuous stories continuing from the end of Nemesis showing the future of what happened to everyone when they came back, you know, from the Delta Quadrant with Voyager, what happened to all the characters from your favorite characters from the Next Generation, what happened with Deep Space Nine, you know, what happened to Cisco? did he ever come back? Like, all those things are answered and there are years worth of stories. The amount of stories that are in the books, continuing those, is like getting another five seasons of Deep Space Nine and Voyager and TNG is really like, it's like getting those. Like you're missing out on so much if you don't read those stories. It's incredible. That as a whole is probably my favorite. Just being able to continue the adventures of those characters, seeing eventually down the line, without spoiling anything, there's a new Deep Space Nine, and we'll explain the context of that, but seeing characters like Ro Laren come back and be the new Chief of Security on Deep Space Nine, seeing Sisko, like, what happens with Sisko? Does he come back? And what happens? And what happens post-Dominion War? What happens with the Voyager crew when they come back? There's so much to explore, and I love it. That's my favorite. And then some other series, like New Frontier, that focus on a specific crew or ship that's not in one of the shows, or the Titan books with Riker and seeing those adventures. Uh, I, I really like, again, that's probably about to pick favorites, uh, ones that continue the story on you know, moving again Star Trek into the future and seeing what happened to those characters 10, 20 something years in the future, uh, and carrying along those journeys. Those are, are probably my favorites and uh, ones that I really like that are different from that. There's a lot of just kind of individual ones that I really like. Again, those numbered ones are very hit or miss. A lot of them are just kind of as a generic one-off episode, but then there's always ones that crop up. They're like, wow, that was genuinely like a fantastic standalone book. So those, you know, that uh, there's a good big variety, but again, my favorites are the ones that continue the story or ones that maybe focus on a very specific character, like the lives of Dax and things like that. I really like those. Uh, but just a little teaser for the future, I will talk about my favorite Star Trek book is actually Deep Space Nine Warped. And you're going to have to wait for that video for an explanation because it's not a perfect book. It's not a super popular book. Why in the world would it be my favorite? It doesn't even fit in the context of, like, being a book that continues on in the future. It takes place during the early seasons of Deep Space Nine. Like, it goes against everything that is normally my favorite. So why the heck would that randomly, you know, seemingly random choice be my favorite book? So that's a future video to uh, talk about, because that's actually, I think, a little of an interesting story in itself. Uh, but thank you for joining me for the Q&A. Thank you to everyone who participated. I ended up getting a lot of questions, and uh, thankfully, you know, good variety and stuff. I think this turned out to be really cool and hopefully gives you an insight into some things you may be curious about. Uh, so thank you for watching and I'll be back again tomorrow with more Trek-A-Day.